Some of you may have uh, heard about this webinar series through Green Teachers Podcasts, Talking with Green Teachers, which you can get on all of the regular podcast apps. And the most recent episode with our speaker this evening uh, was with our speaker this evening, Markham Hislip. He is joining us today in the first of three webinars about teaching climate and energy solutions. I just want to very quickly before I properly introduce our speaker Markham this evening, I just do want to recognize our webinar partners. You probably heard about this webinar series from some of these partners, both in Canada and the United States. Many of them are fellow NGOs in the environmental education field, and we thank them very much for spreading the word about this because ultimately we're in the same boat. We're pulling in the same direction towards a sustainable future. So Markham Hislip, I had the pleasure of interviewing him last week for the podcast. He's one of Canada, uh, North America's really, I should say, leading climate and energy journalists. You can find out more by visiting his website, Energy Media, that's energy spelled with an I. He also hosts his own podcast, Energy Talks, which you can find on the regular podcast hosting apps. I've enjoyed many of his video interviews on his YouTube channel, which I highly encourage you to subscribe to. I've enjoyed many of his podcasts and have learned a lot both in interviewing him myself and just in reading his work, listening to his work, and watching his work. We're very pleased that he is with us today, joining us from beautiful British Columbia. Take it away, Markham Hislip. Well, thank you very much, Ian. Really appreciate that. And uh, also thanks to Sydney and, and Kathy for being part of the uh, order team that organized uh, the presentation today. Uh, I am going to be talking about uh, the energy transition. It's uh, something, I'll give you just a quick uh, bit of background about me. I've uh, been doing uh, online journalism. My wife, uh, Joanne, and I started uh, our first online news media company in 2008. So we're veterans of going broke at this. <laughs> We've been around for a while, uh, but we persevered. And uh, the we started doing a, a lot of energy reporting around 2000 and probably 12. And when we started energy, energy media in early 2015, we wanted it to be an energy transition, uh, do energy transition journalism. Uh, which means that we uh, report on both the oil and gas uh, industry and adaptation and decline, uh, as well as the, the rise of the clean energy economy. And the, in the course of that time, and I guess this harkens back to uh, my master's work that I did back in the, in the mid 80s, uh, which was all about the transition from uh, horses and steam to uh, power farming mach and machinery in Saskatchewan in 1900 to 1930. So that's kind of where I got the, my, my first, uh, I got the itch around technology change. And uh, the model that I used in my thesis uh, worked, uh, was, I was able to adapt it for my work as a journalist, and uh, it's, it was useful to have all of that theory and and uh, and some of the insights and and basically have a handle on it. So, uh, Ian, if we could get into the first slide, please. I have to apologize. Uh, I, I couldn't get my slide sharing to work on Zoom, so Ian is going to have to uh, to be the uh, to have to operate that and. With any luck, there we go. So I, we, our audience, uh, Energy Media's audience, is primarily influencers. So lots of academics and professionals and policymakers, and lot, lots and lots of teachers, and uh, not so much the uh, the general public. Though we do have a fairly large following in Canada and, and to a lesser extent in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, but I often am asked to explain, you know how the energy transition works. I do a lot of radio interviews. And so I've had to think about this in, in very, you know, make it simple, easy to understand. So put some, uh, some structure, a framework around it uh, so that everybody can understand. And Ian, if you could switch to the next slide, please. So this is a, a really simple one. And I, excuse me, I'm just going to, there we go. We're gonna start as simple as it gets, just a, a timeline. And there have been lots of, there have been other energy transitions. Uh, this one happened to start in the 
1990s. Now, depending on who you talk to, some academics will put the date of this energy transition, you know, in the 1970s, for instance, uh, if you include nuclear energy and so on. But I, I like to think that the suite, the core of the technologies, the clean energy technologies that, that we're going to be depending on over the next, uh, well, going forward, really got their start in the 1990s. So we have the lithium ion battery that uh, was introduced in 1991. You've got the GM EV one that was introduced in 96. You've got commercial wind and solar farms that you get to see in the 90s popping up in places like Texas, thanks to George W. Governor George W. Bush's renewable portfolios, for example. And then we get into, you know, 30, roughly 30 years later, uh, we get the 2020s where we are today. This is the decade of disruption. So all the, all the technologies that were introduced back in those 1990s, and there's many, many more other than the ones I just mentioned, many of them were stimulated by government policy. So there were there was I mentioned George W. Bush and his renewable portfolio. So there were subsidies. There was the Energiewende in Germany with uh, feed-in tariffs and and so on. And that's what really provided the support for a lot of these technologies to begin uh, to get out of the lab, get out of the people's garages wherever they were developed, and get into the market where they could be used. And then over time. You know, the technology was improved, costs came down. And after, uh, I, I often like it to uh, uh, priming a pump. And uh, when I was a kid, uh, my grandfather had a farm in, in Northern Saskatchewan and uh, we would go out there, you know, the odd weekend and uh, little Markham would be sent out to, to get a pail of water. So you'd have to go out to the pump and you'd have to pour a little water down the pump to get it primed. And then you pump for a while and then eventually it would begin to, uh, it would flow on its own, didn't need to be primed anymore. And the period from the 1990s up to today is that pump has been primed. And this technology now has got to the point where it is competitive and it's beginning to move, it's moved into the marketplace, it's beginning to crowd out, push out, uh, the fossil fuel technologies, uh, coal, oil, and gas. And so that's the, this is a really key decade. It's going to be a very, very disruptive decade. And we're seeing that all already. I was just before I came on, on here, I did a three hours of interviews for CBC Radio in Canada about the Hertz deal to buy 100,000 Tesla Model 3s for their, for their rental fleet, mostly in the US and, and in a couple of European cities. And we're seeing more and more of that all the time. So the automobile industry is getting disrupted. The electricity system, uh, electricity industry is getting disrupted. The buildings, uh, industry, on and on and on are all getting disrupted. And after the 2030, there'll still be disruption, just probably not at the level of the intensity that we see today. Then we get into a maturing where the maybe you know, these new technologies now are either, they either make up 50% or close to that of the marketplace. And then they kind of, you know, they they keep continue on for the next 20, 30, maybe even some cases 40 years until they get to be 80, 90 or, or 100% of the marketplace. So this is the, this we're going to start here with a basic timeline. And if you think of this as slow, slow, slow at the beginning, then a period of really intense disruption for a decade, and then slower, or you know, uh, yeah, slower, but still continuing with strong growth out after 2030. That's kind of the basic approach to this. Uh, Ian, if you, next slide, please. Okay, here we have two curves that I use frequently in my journalism, and the one on the uh, the orange one is an S curve. And it basically plots the path by which uh, technologies are uh, introduced to the market and then find their way uh, uh, as they grow and develop and take more and more market share until they get up to, to 100%. And that basic mark, that, that basic S curve uh, is, uh, it'll give you a good idea of where we are today. So you can see over in the far left-hand side, uh, well, maybe, let me back up a little bit. Before we get into that, the, the blue curve 
is the technology adoption curve. And this is language that we hear all the time. The innovators, the early adopters, the early majority. It came from uh, a scholar named E.A. E. Rogers, uh, an American scholar. And uh, I think he wrote his first book, uh, early 60s. Um, and basically you can kind of, you know, this is a rough guide. It's not, uh, uh, you know, cut, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not set in stone, but look, the technology we talked about before, like wind and solar and, and EVs and, uh, and so on, and batteries, you know, they are now at that five to 10, maybe 15% uh, share of the market. And so that tells us that we're, we're past the innovators and the innovators are generally those, we all know innovators. Th those are the folks who will pay the most and put up with the highest degree of risk that the technology will fail. So those are the guys that are that are out in the tents in front of the Apple store, maybe not, you know, waiting for the iPhone, the latest iPhone, maybe not so much now, but you know, seven, eight, nine years ago, that was certainly that was a thing. You know, they've always got to have the the latest and the greatest the, the gadgets. And then as the uh, the technology matures a little bit and gets more accepted, you get into early adopters. So, you know, from zero to 13 and a half percent, roughly, you've got innovators. And then from 13 and a half to 34 percent, you've got early adopters. And you can see how the, uh, the S curve now is starting to cut, you know, at, you're starting to see a, 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 an inflection point is, is coming. My wife and I are, are early majority, and I'll illustrate the point. Uh, we bought our uh, plasma TV, big 50-inch uh, TV, in 2007. But they'd been around for, for years before that. But that was the point at which the price had come down about as much as it was reasonably going to come down. The technology had improved. So it didn't have, you know, they solved the problem with ghosting and some of the other issues. And it was, a, at that point, it was good value for the money. Yeah, it was more money than you spend for a CRT an old style, you know, uh, TV, but it was, it was a, a really good, uh, it was good value for the money. And so we would be in that early, early majority uh, category. And the, and we would, so uh, if you, as the, the, as the new technology is adopted and it goes through those, you know, it gets into the marketplace and more and more people buy it, it goes up that curve on the, on the orange curve, and then you can see where the types of buyers are on the blue curve. And I think that between these two curves, it uh, explains a lot of how the, uh, the, the technology, uh, uh, where we're at in the energy transition and where we're at for most of the technology we've been talking about is we're still just at the, uh, at the uh, in, still in the innovators section, in some cases, into the early adopters. There's still a lot of growth to happen and disruption to happen before we can say that the energy transition is, is over or even uh, well underway. It's got a good start and it's ready uh, to take off. Uh, if we could have the next, the next screen, uh, there we go. Now we're back to, uh, and, and in, this, uh, in this presentation, I'm gonna be, uh, toggling a little bit between the the really simple model and some nerdy stuff like the the two curves to kind of illustrate uh, how uh, the, my points about the the technologies moving up those curves so here's uh here's the hockey stick growth. we will all we've all heard about you know hockey stick growth right and so if you think if you use this uh image and as incorporating the uh, the two, the orange curve and the blue curve from the last slide, you know, basically the innovators start at the toe of the, the hockey stick blade in the early uh, 1990s. They progress their way to the right, you know, up along the, the blade of the stick and you get to the early adopters. And then you get that inflection point, excuse me, <coughs> the inflection point, which is the heel of the hockey stick, and that's when you sales really begin to take off. Adoption begins to really take off. And now you get this, you know, the shaft going up at a 45 degree angle and you're getting really uh, 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 strong growth uh, and disruptive growth. 
and and then of course you get to the late majority and then you get to to the laggards so i find this is a a, a useful way to explain to folks who uh you know maybe are regular readers and and so on about how this operates and one of the things before we get into we're going to i'm going to give you some data in, a, in a, just a few minutes that backs up those four technologies i was talking about uh, before i do i want to talk about enabling technology because this is this is really important there are technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning and automation and robotics and uh, quantum computing and so on that that aren't necessarily energy technologies. Uh, they're not, uh, you know, wouldn't think of them as being part of the energy transition, but they're really important to facilitating and supporting the growth of those techno energy technologies that we will be talking about. And so you see that in electric vehicles, artificial intelligence is going to be, is increasingly important. And uh, when we get autonomous vehicles on the road, maybe you know later this later this decade uh, maybe by 2030 they'll be really important and because uh, for crunching all of the data uh, that needs to be crunched in order to keep the, the riders safe and and the uh, the autonomous vehicle uh, operating as it's uh, supposed to so if we could get the next slide uh, in now here we get into some nerdy stuff so a levelized cost of energy, the LCOE, is basically you take a technology like wind or solar and you estimate, you take all the costs, the op capital costs and the operating costs and the installation costs and so on, and you uh, amortize them over the, the length of the, the lifetime of, of that uh, you know, solar panel or wind turbine. And then that gives you a cost per megawatt hour or cost per kilowatt hour. And, and uh, what you can see here is on the far left uh, in both the, the wind and the solar is look at how much costs have come down in the last 12 years. So uh, if we're going to talk about wind, uh, the cost of, per megawatt hour of wind back in 2009 ranged from $101 to $169. But only 11 years later, uh, now it's down to $26 and $54. It's the cheapest way to, it's the least cost way to generate electricity that there is. And the, the, uh, uh, the bar there, it, it gives you an idea of the difference in prices between various regions. There's some regional variation in costs caused by, you know, labor costs or uh, other kind of, kind of costs, installation costs that uh, make it a little more expensive. And look over at solar. I mean, uh, how much it's declined there? Three hundred and twenty-three dollars a megawatt hour in two thousand and nine, and now we're down to thirty-one dollars. And solar uh, in the very near future, because solar's costs are still coming down, uh, solar is probably going to be down under twenty dollars uh, by twenty thirty-five or, or twenty forty. Uh, there's still, a, and solar will be the uh, the far and away the, uh, the least cost way to generate electricity. Um, can we have the, the next uh, slide, please, Ian? This is levelized cost of energy, but I want to show you some of the older technologies. So you can see new coal. If you were to build a, a coal plant uh, tomorrow, it would cost between $65 and $159 uh, per megawatt hour, far more than wind and solar. The nearest competitor is gas combined cycle. You see a lot of that being built. You see it's a lot of it on, in Ontario, and you see in places like Alberta, uh, the U.S., <coughs> excuse me, places like Texas, even California is adding some gas. And, uh, but it's more, it's more expensive. Now, the difference, of course, uh, the reason why uh, the, the uh, jurisdictions are going to gas is because it's what's called firm power. Uh, and it, uh, whereas with the wind and, and solar, uh, sometimes the wind don't blow and the sun don't shine. And whereas with gas, uh, you can use it for peaking, you can use it as, as, as a base load power. And, and so there's still gas, it'll be uh, quite a while before we get all of the gas uh, power generation out of electricity systems. 
this gives you an idea of how much more competitive wind and solar are. Just to point out a few others, uh, we've got nuclear at $129. So all this talk about nuclear, you know, small modular nuclear and so on. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, it's not looking good for nuclear at those costs. Uh, geothermal, uh, that's another technology that gets a lot of attention in Western Canada, uh, is still expensive at uh, $59 at the, on the low end per megawatt hour. So this gives you an idea of just how much those technologies, uh, the cost of, of uh, wind and solar have come down and why they're now at the inflection point. They're at the heel of that hockey stick and already moving up the shaft of the hockey stick uh, as part of the energy transition. <coughs> Sorry, folks, it's a little, a little dry in my office. I'm just gonna have a, a quick drink of water. Could we get the next slide up, Ian? Now here's a, you probably uh, heard that the uh, International Energy Agency released its World Energy Outlook 2021 uh, a week or, or two ago. And I just wanted to show you here what the, uh, the forecasts are uh, over the next uh, decade. So there's three scenarios in the World Energy Outlook. So steps is basically uh, the policies we have now. The uh, yellow, the APS, is the announced policy. So they haven't been implemented yet, but these are governments talking about, uh, you know, in, in Canada, uh, we've got a low carbon fuel standard coming. We've got uh, uh, oil and gas emissions reduction, uh, emission cap that's coming, those sorts of things. So that's an, uh, an announced policy, but still not implemented. And then in the green is the, is the uh, net zero uh, by 2050 scenario where uh, governments take whatever policies or whatever steps are necessary to phase out fossil fuels uh, entirely. And the, the thing, the point I wanted to make was even in if it's steps, apps, or, or net zero, if you look on the right for solar and wind and other renewables, they are far and away the uh, uh, the uh, method of electricity generation uh, that's going to dominate uh, new electricity uh, additions uh, during the, the, the 2020s. And if we, I couldn't find a chart with uh, uh, scenarios that uh, uh, from 2020 to 2050, but I, uh, I would imagine that they would go out, uh, we would just see a continuation of that trend. So again, this is where we've hit the inflection point and the, these technologies are uh, lowest cost. They offer a lot of other benefits uh, that uh, the other, uh, the other uh, forms of generating electricity don't off offer, such as you know, the lower capital costs and flexibility and all sorts of things. They come with their own problems too, so that shouldn't be discounted, but nevertheless, uh, that's why you're seeing uh, these, you know, elec the electricity sector uh, is going to expand using renewables. And of course, as part of the climate policies, uh, electrification is the number one policy that governments are going to pursue uh, to phase out fossil fuels and lower greenhouse gas emissions uh, within uh, national economies. So this is a, a very important part of the energy transition. And it's partly driven by policy and it's partly driven by lower cost and, other val and, and higher value of the benefits. Uh, and this is a, a point at which uh, scholars debate. Uh, so which is the most important? Is it policy or technology change? Uh, are they, this, or are they, should they be given equal weight? Uh, personally, I, I uh, fall down on the, uh, the energy transition now is essentially driving the bus. Uh, I know we're all, you know, we talk about climate change all the time and the need to, to, to lower emissions, but the truth is, <coughs> the truth is that if all policy stopped tomorrow, the energy transition would continue. The, the, uh, the clean energy technology is simply cheaper, better, and offers more value than fossil fuel technology. And so if you took away the, the policy uh, driving uh, the part of it that's driven by policy, 
then the energy transition would just be a little slower. And so I liken, the, I liken this to a bus. The energy transition is a bus. And if you want to decarbonize faster, you press harder on the accelerator. But the bus is going down the road anyway. Uh, can we get the next slide? Uh, great. Now, this is, so we're talking about electric vehicles. This is a levelized cost of driving. So it's the same kind of a calculation for electric vehicles as we saw earlier uh, for, um, uh, for electricity generation. And this was done by the uh, Canadian Energy Regulator uh, using 2018 data. They did it in 2019. <clears throat> and you can see for the uh, internal combustion engine car at 34 cents per kilometer, already in 2018, the electric vehicle is one cent per kilometer cheaper. And now the electric uh, truck is a couple cents uh, more expensive than uh, an internal combustion engine truck, but you know not much. And now if you go down to 2030, and again, these are, are it's using uh, extrapolating uh, 2018 data, you see already the EV car is less expensive, the, uh, the uh, electric truck is more expensive, and those numbers just keep get, dropping uh, as, uh, as when we get to 2040. So, and, and an interesting uh, note about this study is the baseline for kilometers traveled was 15,000 per year, which is, you know, basically under a uh, thousand uh, miles per month. And if you're driving more, if you have a long commute, uh, you know, I remember, uh, oh, probably 15 years ago, my wife and I were standing in line at, at uh, Disneyland. Uh, down in uh, Anaheim, California, and we got talking with a, a couple, and you know they commuted an hour and a half to two hours every day. Well, that was you know for a Canadian, we we think in terms of ten or fifteen minute commutes, that's a long commute. And these folks were driving, you know, I don't know how many miles that would, a lot of miles. And so for them, their costs actually would be quite a bit lower in an electric vehicle. So. Um, and this gives you, and, and these uh, charts, because the uh, uh, the costs of, of EVs are dropping uh, faster than we expected, batteries are dropping faster than we expected, and so on, uh, these costs are, are actually uh, 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 favor the uh, the gas-powered vehicles uh, more than they, they really should. But it, it's you don't find a lot of levelized cost of driving comparison, so that's why I, I use this one. So Ian, if we could get to the next slide, please. Now I want to give you, here's, this comes from the uh, the in IEA's uh, World Energy Outlook. And, no, sorry, this is a Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, their 2021 EV outlook. And they're kind of the definitive forecasters on electric vehicles. And look at the curves uh, for uh, adoption just in 2025. Uh, you know, in, in the space of between, uh, between uh, 2020 and 2025, in, you're going to see uh, EVs go from uh, 10 million uh, in sales up to over 50 million. And for e-buses and commercial EVs, you see a similar kind of a curve. And in electric two and three wheelers, you see still a steep, a fairly steep uh, curve. And those are all the signs, those are all signs of technologies that have passed the inflection point and now are pushing the old, older technologies out of, out of the marketplace. And so uh, what this shows us, and if, you, if, we, could, if we could see the, uh, uh, this particular uh, version of the, of the outlook that I had didn't go out to 200, uh, oh, sorry, uh, I do have a, a 2040, uh, charts, uh, some charts. Ian, if we could get to the next one, please. But now look at when, they're, when the uh, forecast is projected out to 2040, you know, in Europe, you've got 81 or 82 percent of new passenger sales are electric vehicles. China is like 77, 78. Uh, the United States is up around 75 percent. So what this is, a, this is a sign that the, uh, the energy transition is well on its way uh, and uh, the, uh, the fossil fuel uh, technologies are being uh, pushed out of the market. And that gets back to, you know, that, that simple little model we had. Uh, maybe if we could get the next uh, slide up, Ian. Here we go. So this little conceptual model of the hockey stick with the innovators 
uh, all of the data that I've showed for electricity generation and, and electric vehicles, uh, and I didn't have anything for batteries, but they, they, the curves all look uh, pretty much uh, the same. Uh, but you can see that that's where the energy transition is going. And, and so if we're going to solve the issue of climate change, a lot of it is going to have to be taking the old technology that got us into this mess in the first place and replacing it with better technology that doesn't emit and uh, is either low carbon or, or zero carbon. And if you're explaining it to students, uh, this is not a bad little model to to uh, uh, to use. It's uh, you can uh, there's data uh, well beyond what I've shown you here that you can find read fairly readily on the, on the web with the, the major uh, all kinds of information from the International Energy Agency, uh, the uh, International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. The U.S. Energy Information Administration has got a lot of information on this. There's, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there's no shortage of, uh, of data to back up where we're, we're going with this and uh, uh, that you can plug into this little model uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, demonstrate and, and to prove uh, where, we're, where we're headed. So uh, Ian, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. It's kind of funny when normally when I do these kinds of things, I, I, I don't talk to a PowerPoint and I apologize if I've been a little bit uh, normally, I, I like to do the podcast thing because I can just talk and, and tell stories and so on. But uh, this kind of uh, talking about a model to explain the energy transition, it helps to have those visuals of the hockey stick and the timeline and, and, the, and the access to the data. Uh, so I, I haven't been quite as art, uh, as articulate as I would have liked to, but uh, I hope that uh, I explained that well and, and everybody kind of got the, the the gist of it. So uh, Ian, if you want to throw it open to Q and A, yeah. So uh, just a quick note: we will send the recording out by the end of the week and a follow up email to all of the registrants, uh, including those who weren't able to attend live. Uh, that includes all of the resources that we talk about. Um, what I think we'll do, we'll take a couple quick questions now, and then uh, each of our partner organizations are going to share some resources that are very relevant to what Markham has just been talking about is using this simple model to teach the energy transition. Um, and then anyone who wants to sort of linger on afterwards, by all means, stick around uh, for any additional questions. Um, if you do have any questions now, you can throw those into the chat box. I want to kick things off because um, both in this presentation, both in the podcast discussion, th there was this great sense of optimism about the fact that the this is almost like a runaway train that's already happening, which is very encouraging. And we just saw that report come out in the middle of September from the Lancet about climate anxiety. And that's certainly not the only place where we've been hearing about the impact that this is having on all people, but these reports were focused on young people. Um, but then on the flip side of the optimism is the potential for so-called techno-optimism to be another delaying or deflective tool for people whose interests are different from having an energy transition. So uh, the question for you, Markham, is what is that sweet spot in optimism based in reality, but also this techno optimism that can have an, an insidious side? Right. The idea, I think, the insidious part of techno optimism is that we don't have to do anything ourselves. We don't have to take any actions uh, either on the policy level or on the individual level uh, because technology is just going to come along and save save our uh, save us from ourselves, basically. And I, I, while I do think of myself as a techno optimist, that is that if we can make this transition to uh, uh, to uh, these new technologies, uh, society will be much better off. We, we have a, at least a decent shot of arresting uh, global warming uh, at uh, 1.2, uh, one, sorry, 1 1.5 uh, degrees uh, uh, Celsius. The, um, during the, the podcast uh, in, uh, you know, you and I talked about Tony Siba, uh, who uh, is a, uh, probably the king of techno-optimists because he believes that there are 
revolution, revolutionary technology uh, that is transforming different sectors of the economy, electricity, uh, transportation, food and agriculture, and so on. And in the same way that technology uh, changed a uh, hundred years ago. So if you know, I did my master's thesis on the transition from horses to, to tractors and combines, basically. And if you look at my, my mother-in-law, uh, Doris, uh, who is uh, uh, still with us and uh, 95, but she grew up on a farm in, in Saskatchewan in the 1920s. And we've been back to, you know, her hometown. And uh, the countryside is just, it's emptied out. It's unpopulated because, you know, we got three and 4,000 acre farms and, and you know, uh, her nephew now, uh, farms the uh, 3,000 acres by himself with big machinery, some of which is automated. And so you didn't need all those little towns and you didn't even need, almost hardly need regional centers because be farmers will drive everywhere. And, and, it, and it transformed Canada and the U.S. from rural agrarian societies in, into urban societies. And you can't understate the, uh, the magnitude of that change. And so that kind of that kind of transformation is coming not only Siba uh, would argue uh, not only in how we use energy it's coming in basically how we lead our lives we will lead very different lives how we eat we won't be we won't be eating a lot of beef and and, and meat we'll be eating we'll be putting together food from in basically in laboratories almost almost like a, the impossible burger that AW uh, offers here in Canada uh, all of that technology is either here or it's we're right on the cusp of it and and it will we will be uh, everything will happen at lower cost uh, we will be healthier uh, we will fix climate change he says uh, and we will uh, we will be um, <clears throat> I was going to say compatible with the environment. We we will be much more environmentally friendly uh, than we are now. So there is the hope, and I don't mean to say utopia because you can't have seven and a half or eight nine billion people on a planet without having you know being disruptive and having problems. But Tony Siba holds out the hope that, that this next iteration of humanity, that based on new energy technologies and all these things, will be much better than the current one. And if you take that view, that is the only optimistic view I've ever run across that I would, I would share with a teenager and say, man, there's hope. There, there, the, your... Your, the life that you are, when you get out of high school and you go through college and you get out in, into the marketplace, start a family, do all the things that humans do, you could, there is a possibility that you will have a, a better life. And so uh, the downside to that is uh, we just sit around and do nothing because technology is going to save us and we don't do what we should do and act in a, in a responsible manner and we don't, uh, so on. So we, as, as C and Siba points out, if we don't make good societal choices and our leadership doesn't make good, the right decisions, good decisions, uh, it could easily be catastrophe as much as it, uh, we could have utopia. So and that's a perfect transition to Sydney's question. And we'll, we'll take these two questions that are in the timeline, then we'll do the resource share, and then we can take any additional questions after that. So in terms of making those right choices, obviously we have to rely on our political leaders for much of that. And that brings us down to policy. What are some of the key policies? If we had to prioritize, like what are the most important ones to really propel this transition forward? Sure. Before I talk about specific policies, let me tell you about a debate that's going on because, and this plays has played out uh, in very practical terms in Canada, and you're starting to see it more in the United States. So I interviewed a professor, Dan, Dr. Danny Cullenward from Stanford. He written, had written a book with another a colleague of his about climate policy. And, it, and, it's, and there's been a lot, economists love carbon pricing, right? They love carbon taxes, cap and trade. And, uh, and that's been adopted widely in Canada to a lesser degree in, in the US, so California and other places do have cap and trade. And he said, Carbon pricing alone will never do it for, for a variety of reasons. So you need to combine carbon pricing 
with industrial policy. So those are regulations and um, uh, so we might have, for instance, z uh, zero emission vehicle mandates. Uh, California's got those, uh, British Columbia and Quebec have, have got those. You, you might have things like uh, methane emission reduction uh, targets, uh, but if you don't use carbon pricing, you use regulations to ensure that leaks get plugged in pipelines and, and valves and uh, get fixed on you know, gas processing plants. You know, so that's an that's a, a idea of, or an example of a, uh, of a regulation. And the idea was that you put together this suite of policies that includes carbon pricing. Carbon pricing is very important, but then you have other subsidies and regulations and, and so on that, that augment them and support them. And so to answer the question, Sydney's question was a very good one. Uh, first of all, carbon pricing, that, that's absolutely true. And then the question is, uh, which sector are we talking about? So if you're talking about transportation, then z zero, emission, uh, zero emission vehicle mandates uh, certainly would help. Subsidies have gotten us part of the way, but without mandates, uh, we, don't, we won't be able to move fast enough. Though so, uh, the Norwegians would argue differently because Norway's now, I, mean, I forget what the, the percentage is of new vehicle sales that are EVs, but it's very high. Uh, but uh, it worked for, for a, a country of 10 million, not likely to work in a country like Canada or in the United States. So mandates would, would be another one. And then after that, uh, there really are uh, a whole, it, I can't, I, I wouldn't be able to pick out a specific type of regulation or, or other policy because they all kind of work in conjunction. And I think that's the important thing is, is that we uh, uh, we need a whole whole of government whole of economy approach to to policy? We, there aren't any silver bullets here. The, the, the economy is too big, too complex. There's too much to do in too short a time. We need a whole. And I think Canada actually at the federal level uh, is doing uh, now has a, a pretty good. The experts say that we have a we doing a good job. At the provincial level, not everybody's doing a good job. You know, BC and Quebec are doing a good job. Ontario is doing a not so good job and Alberta, Saskatchewan uh, are doing bad jobs. So, you know, that, getting all the governments on board is, is, uh, is an important part of this. In the US, I mean, look, look at the, debating, the debate that's going on over the, the Biden government's uh, infrastructure, or Biden administration's uh, infrastructure bill and all of, you know, Joe Manchin, the, 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 and the, the, the compromises, gutting the program. So that's a, that's a real problem, getting everybody a degree at the federal level. And then you get down to the same problem that Canada has where California's got good, good policy and Washington and Oregon, not so much Texas and Oklahoma and places like that. It's a big challenge uh, getting that policy right. That being said, even if Texas, I mean, look at how much Texas is adopting wind and solar, and it's not doing it because of policies anymore. It's doing it because it's the cheapest way to generate electricity. So I can kind of illustrates my point. So I'm, I'm not sure. Does that answer your question, Sydney? And I, I read a, a book recently, The Case for Climate Capitalism by Tom Rand, that details much of of that same approach of you know it's it's not an either or i mean i know we live in this very polarized world where everything is social media driven and it's this or that and it's like well no it's it's policy and it's the market you know both of them have to work together completely leaving it up to the market is insane completely leaving it in the hands of government isn't going to work it, it has to be a mix it has to be a as many solutions a, as we can sort of throw up the wall and that links nicely to Beth's question about, you know, given the timelines, we, the two dates we hear about the most short term are 2030 and 2050. Do we have enough time to meet those targets with the adoption timelines of the technology? Beth, that's a really great question. And I, and I don't, there is no answer. Uh, I don't, well, I guess we'll have to see. The projections are right now that we're not going to do it, but by the same token, we're still in a position where we could do it. And I think that uh, China and the US are, you know, the two world's two biggest polluters uh, or emitters of greenhouse gas emissions. 
uh, are going to have to get their act together. And the how difficult that is, again, getting back to the, the debate around this infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better Act and all of that stuff. The, the debate that's going on in Congress right now illustrates how difficult that is. And so, you know, we all had high hopes for COP26 uh, starts this week. And now that's been tempered by some comments from UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson and and uh, and other other comments from world leaders. But you know that at the end of the day, I think the International Energy Agency was uh, pretty succinct about it. Without stronger government policy, we're not going to make it. That it's as simple as that. We have all the technology we need, and we'll we'll have be some better technology as we go along. I mean. You know, hydrogen will be commercial in 2030 or 2035 in a way it's not now. Uh, small modular reactors, depending on how you feel about that, you know, might be around in 20 by mid 2030s and so on. But it won't be enough if we don't have strong policy. And there's another side to this, and that is think back again 100 years and, and to the emergence of the internal combustion engine and all of the industries that flowed from that. I mean, uh, auto manufacturing, truck manufacturing, implement manufacturing, um, uh, freight service, uh, airplanes, you know, aviation industry, all of that really began in the, in the period after the, the First World War. And the kind of uh, uh, economic uh, transformation uh, that happened then is essentially begun, uh, begun now. And if we, if uh, North America or if Europe, parts of Asia, we're all competing for that to be to be competitive and to be dominant in these new industries, and so it's not just greenhouse. It's not just the, the climate issue. It's if we want to maintain our level of prosperity and and uh, to have the kind of life our kids to have the kind of lifestyles that we've enjoyed, then we're going to have we need to invest in these new industries. To, to do that. So this is a, this is almost a wicked problem, you know, so complex that you, there is no solution for it. And, and uh, I, I don't know where that leaves us, uh, frankly, it's, uh, we, uh, uh, it's difficult, do, but I, you asked the question, do I think uh, with all of the, the technology, the new technologies that are coming, are we going to meet our GHG emissions targets? I'd say it's at best a 50-50 at this point in the game. We do have the tools. It's just the matter of taking that decisive action now. This is certainly something we hear again and again. I'm going to pass the virtual baton over to Sydney now. She's going to be sharing some teacher resources from the green learning side, and then I will do the same for from the green teacher side, and then Kathy will do the same from the ACE side. Uh, I'm also just putting in the chat box the feedback form. It's a Google form, only takes a couple minutes to fill out. We would uh, invite everyone to do that because remember this is part one of a three-part series. Uh, in the next session, which is Wednesday next week, we will be digging a bit more into this discussion about different approaches to the, uh, the energy transition and to what extent the market, to what extent the market plays a role, to what extent policy and government plays a role and getting much more into the nitty gritty and details of that, which is of course a very interesting and essential discussion. So Sydney. Awesome, thank you. Um, and thank you as well, Mark, and that was uh, fantastic. I know I learned a lot of really um, new information, which is awesome, especially seeing that data makes it really real. Um, so hi folks, I'm from Green Learning. We are a national not-for-profit that creates free online resources about energy, climate change, and the green economy. Um, today, I'm just going to be briefly showing you one of our programs called ReEnergy. Um, so this program is all about renewable energy technologies. I did drop the link there in the chat, so if you want to check it out, you can head there. Um, all the resources are free. This particular program is geared towards grade four to eight. Um, if you want to get some curriculum connections, um, you can download the resource here. I won't get too much into that. I'll just give you a brief overview. Marco mentioned we're going to this transition to these different types of renewable energy, uh, particularly wind and solar. Um, within this program, we have seven different modules, each covering a different type of renewable energy technology. Um, within each of these modules, there are student-friendly backgrounders. So if you're looking for information that you can pass right off to your students, 
um, they can read and absorb and understand um, that information is there. There's also activities to get to know these um, different types of technologies, as well as construction plans. So students can actually build every type of renewable energy technology that you see here, starting with the famous solar oven. Um, we are in the process of adding a PV module construction plan to this module, um, which will be an electric vehicle, um, a solar electric vehicle. We also do have an entire suite of activities geared towards teaching students about not only what electric vehicles are um, and the market, but also how to adapt to them. So, um, for example, planning a trip in an electric vehicle is much different than driving um, a combustion engine vehicle. The planning is different because the infrastructure is different. Um, looking at what type of electric vehicle you would buy, you know, range has increased substantially over the last few years and will continue to increase, but that's still something that families need to consider and students need to be aware of as they move forward. Um, so all of these activities do have uh, lesson plans, so step-by-step -step instructions and assessment tools with them. Moving into wind energy, and I'm just going to pop into one of these activities and just actually show you what this program is like. Um, so within our wind program, of course, you can build a wind turbine, a model wind turbine, um, but you can also play around with some of our simulators. Um, so this one here, you can kind of interact with the turbine and discover new information. Um, it's really fun. There's a few different stages that students can go through from going right into the wind turbine and learning about the different parts. Um, the idea is that one day these students will either be using these types of um, technologies or they're going to be employed in sectors that use them. And so being aware of these technologies, how they work, uh, is really, really important. So I'm just back on the main page here um, and I'm going to scroll back down to uh, just past wind energy. So as I mentioned, we have the simulator there, how to build a wind turbine. Um, I love this pumped hydro storage activity because it actually takes you on a virtual tour of a hydroelectric dam. So students can see and experience that. Um, if you have access to any of these, a wind farm, a solar farm, taking your students there is obviously the best um, option. Uh, we have a full suite of energy storage activities as well, some labs and experiments in there as well. Um, if you do have any questions about these resources, I'm gonna throw my email in the chat here. Feel free to reach out to me anytime I'm happy to support you along in uh, learning about these technologies. We also do have an annual challenge where if you build any type of renewable energy technology, uh, you and your students can enter in to win some really awesome prizes. Um, so in a really quick snippet, that is our renewable energy program. Um, again, the link is in the chat. So if you do have any questions or want to check it out, uh, feel free to have a look there. And I will pass it back off to Ian. Thank you so much, Sydney. Just in the interest of time, I'll make my section from the green teacher side of things very, very short. Uh, I won't even do a screen share. I've got a PowerPoint, but I, I'll just include that in the follow-up email that we'll send out by the end of the week. Um, green teacher has been a, a content provider of lessons in environmental education for 30 years, and it's all archived now in our portal. And we sort of jumping on the, the Netflix structure of things. We have it organized by topic, by age category. Uh, we've got about 500 activities and lessons. And then each recording of the webinars that we do, which is 120 plus and counting. Uh, it is subscriber based and all of the funding taken from that, uh, as we are a charity, goes into our free webinar program, our free podcast and production of our next series of books. We've got two books, Teaching Kids and Teaching Teens About Climate Change. And we are in discussions about writing a book about climate solutions, which is a perfect segue to, uh, to Jen's question that we will get to in a bit more depth after Kathy shares what is available from the Alberta Council of Environmental Education. And I will just do a couple of screen shares. So we are in Alberta, but um, a lot of the resources that we have um, do... Uh, work in various uh, places across Canada or the US. So we have a resource hub. I put that in the um, chat for you. And so for teachers, you can search by teaching resources, field trips, uh, field trips might be more um, uh, locally based. And then you can see, you can search by grade, you can search by uh, subject and you can search by topic. And even if you want to search by resource top type. So it's just a great place um, from anything from outdoor learning, 
biodiversity to climate change, energy, um, all of these uh, resources are in there. And also, um, you know, there's lots of schools looking for grants as well to do some of their projects. Um, and there's teacher professional development and lots of readings um, as well. Um, the other thing that I'm just going to mention is um, Eco Schools Canada um, is now available across Canada. It was a program started in Ontario. And basically, Eco Schools Canada is um, helping schools kind of create their action plan. So it is very much about schools taking action. And then schools, um, they have 40, over 40 eco actions that you can do in your school and it helps you get certification, um, but it's really just trying to give recognition for the environmental learning and climate action that schools um, are taking. And so that's available for any school in Canada. We're a partner with them and providing support here in Alberta. Um, and I know in the United States, there's the Green Schools program as well, which is uh, kind of similar. Um, and also uh, just, it helps. I always use the, uh, the slogan, um, um, it's from Dr. David Orr, that uh, hope is a verb uh, with, my can't my, I say this all the time. <laughs> Hope is a I've lost it. Okay, Ian or Sydney, one of you know it. <laughs> no. Something like hope is a verb with its gloves on. I, I don't or think with it's the exactly sleeves yet, rolled up. Sleeves, sleeves rolled, rolled yes, up. Yes. Yeah. 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 I thought I, I, I was like, that can't be right. So and it's just that when we roll up our sleeves and take action, that's what can give our students hope because then they feel like they're doing something and it gets away from the doom and gloom side of climate change, which really uh, ties into that. So check those out. That's all I'm going to share for now. And um then we can dig into more of uh, Jen's question if we want. Yeah, and that certainly answers a big part of it. I mean, e eco anxiety, eco grief, climate anxiety, climate change anxiety, it, it goes by different names, but they're all very much in the same boat. And it's, it's real, it's growing, it's getting worse. And it's not just young people either. It, it, it's just the young people are the ones that are projected to live the most of these impacts and a lot of books have been written about it um, sydney mentioned hope matters i'm reading a book right now commanding hope by thomas homer dixon um, that talks a lot about how we do need to as a starting point for hope we do need to start with clear-eyed realism and that in this topic does involve looking at some very distressing things but and this is something markham and i talked about in the podcast is that w without hope without optimism you're cooked. And uh, if this is a perfect opportunity to transition back over to Markham. Um, what's your approach to managing eco-anxiety? Um, uh, a couple of years ago, in December of 2019, I was at um, uh, Energy Future Labs at a, uh, uh, a five-day conference on energy narratives. And there was a presentation by a fellow named uh, Dr. Anil Chima. He was a neuropsychologist or psychiatrist from Stanford. And uh, his basic message was that, uh, and remember, this was still in the time of Trump. In fact, it was probably at the apex of Trump's uh, nonsense. And he was saying that, uh, you know, that kind of populism, negative populism, based on fear, uh, it, there's only one antidote for it. And, and it is hope and optimism. That's the only thing that changes. So if, if there are uh, you know, students, for example, who are feeling uh, eco-anxiety, eco-grief, uh, uh, there are lots of opportunities. So often when I'm interviewing researchers and, and professors, I remember one time, I, you could probably find this in our, on our YouTube channel if you search for membrane, because I was interviewing a, a professor, a researcher from the Simon Fraser University, and he was doing work on some kind of high-tech membrane that, that had uh, climate um, uh, implications. And I remember at the end of it, I, I asked him, I said, you know, are you all looking for, you know, technicians and, you know, researchers and scientists and so on for your work? And is there an opportunity for youth? 
who are, you know, maybe looking at a career and maybe thinking about going to university. He said, we can't get enough of them. We can't just cannot get enough of them. And another time I was interviewing uh, Berthe de Bray, who's uh, the, uh, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, he is the engineer tasked with figuring out how to make uh, electric vehicles talk to houses or talk to the power grid. So you plug in, uh, you want to share power back and forth between the grid and, and, and so that they can, you know, the utility can pull power from your EV battery when it needs to. He's the guy making that work over there. And I said, well, what's the, the biggest you know, impediment to making this work? He said, well, we got the technology figured out. We don't have enough technicians. We don't have enough engineers. We don't have enough smart people who, to work on it. And this is over and over again. And, and my point here is that there, there are so many companies, so many organizations and people working on solutions to this problem. And there are so many opportunities. I mean, there. If youth want are feeling, you know, bummed out because you know the my generation, you know, is burning up the planet. Uh, they can get involved, and there's nothing like getting involved uh, to help someone feel better about, you know, they're taking action. And there are going to be enormous opportunities for youth who who want to do that in whatever capacity as an activist as a scientist as a researcher a technologist on and on and on if they want to look uh the people that i'm i'm asking the question of uh, say that they're look they want them they they're looking for them and that might be uh you know an, an answer or a partial answer uh to your your question uh, uh sydney uh you know about about what to do is get people involved because there's certainly lots of opportunities. Oh, sorry, it was Jen, wasn't it? Jen. That's a very fitting note to end up on. And I, I know we've gone a bit over the hour, but thank you those who stuck with us for doing just that. Again, we'll have the recording of this ready by the end of the week, and we will send the link along in a follow-up email that will also include the resources that we've shared, links, and the text from the chat box because there's been some useful stuff in there as well. And remember part two of this series is next week same time same day of the week wednesday and then part three will be later in november so let uh, let your friends and colleagues know you know we a big part of these uh, is the opportunity for discussion and i think everybody is coming with big questions and concerns related to this and how to teach this and we love to get the, that discussion going and get even more people's input so uh, keep spreading the word we'd love to continue getting the word out to folks because this is really important stuff and uh, we don't know what the future holds but there is very real reason for hope and we don't have to create any new gizmos as markham has detailed so uh so well for us this evening so thank you for joining us let us know if you have any questions drop us an email and we hope to see you next week and in part three and don't forget to click on the evaluation link that so that that um Ian put in the chat as well yeah we have prizes for that as well Ooh.